A reading from the life of Jesus as told by his good friend and follower, John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Well, happy Easter, y'all. We are so glad you're here. I hope you've already been welcomed by everybody. My name is Ed, and I also want to welcome you. We're so honored you came uh, to spend a little bit of your day with us today. I've been around here for a long time, and every Easter I start by saying the same thing. Easter is the whole deal for Christianity. There isn't anything else other than Easter. Other religions have their high holy days, and they're really important, all of them. And a lot of publicity goes into, in our country, of saying that Christmas is the deal for Christianity. Christmas is the deal for merchants in the United States. It is not the deal for Christianity. Christianity rises and falls on the Easter. Everything is based on Easter. If Easter were proven untrue, the whole thing, it would go down. But on Easter morning, like you just saw, nobody expected it to happen. They should have expected it to happen. I mean, Jesus said to them again and again and again, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me, I'm going to be in the grave three days, and then I'm going to rise. But they didn't get it. He told them, he told them again, he told them, and every time apparently they thought it was a parable or an analogy, we don't really know what they thought, because they never asked him. Uh, they didn't understand it, like they didn't understand a lot of things he said. When he arose from the grave, it blew their minds, not because they got it. You just heard it again. They did not know that he had to rise from the dead. Even though there was no body, they were not expecting there not to be a body in that tomb when they went to that grave. And the truth is, I think most Christians really undersell uh, the resurrection. It's why every Easter I talk about basically the same kind of thing in a different kind of way, about the importance of Easter and the importance of the resurrection, and that's what we're going to talk to you about today in a little bit different kind of way. When you think about Easter, when you think about the resurrection, what's the importance you place on it? I mean, what would you say to somebody if they said to you today, What's the importance of the resurrection to Christians? I mean, if you think about Easter, which you probably don't all that often, except like now, what's the importance you put on the resurrection? Now, I would say that if I went and stopped a bunch of Christians on the street, asked, are you a Christian, you know about the resurrection, what's the importance of the resurrection? Most people would say, well, the resurrection proves that Jesus defeated death, and so when I die, I don't have to die. I don't really have to die, which means I don't have to die eternally. I get to go to heaven. And that's certainly a significant thing. It is not the most important thing about the resurrection. It's what most people would think. Because most people, when they think about Christianity, what they think is Christianity offers salvation. And by salvation, what they mean is, what they think of when they think about salvation is, I get to go to heaven when I die and I don't want to go to the other place. I mean, all the Christianity really offers to people, most people think is, you either get to go to heaven if you believe in Jesus and his resurrection, or you go to the other place. And so when they talk to people about Christianity, what they talk about is, do you want to go to heaven, or do you want to go to the other place? And if eternal torment is the, cha the choice you make, it's a pretty easy choice. I mean, if that's all we've got, 
And at the end of your life, you get to go to heaven and you don't have to go into eternal torment. Well, I mean, choosing between that, who would not choose the other thing? But the bigger thing that people don't ask themselves that you really ought to ask yourself is if you go to heaven when you die, will you want to be there? If you wind up in heaven when you die, do you think you would be the kind of person that might like it? I mean, do you think you would enjoy it? And here's what I mean by that. God, in his graciousness and humility, is with you at every moment, of every moment of your whole life, and he is for you every moment of your whole life. But in his humility, he lets you ignore him most of the time. Most of your life, you pay no attention to God, even if you're a follower of Jesus. Most of your life, you are unaware that he is around. When you get to heaven, that option will be gone. Heaven is all about God. Heaven is full of God and his glory at every moment. And if you aren't the kind of person that enjoys being with God, well, heaven might turn out to be eternal torment for you. It might turn out not to be everything you thought it would be cracked up to be. It might not be what you wanted. And if you don't want to live a life with God now, what makes you think you will enjoy it very much at the end of your life? I mean, what does it look like to want to do life with God now, I mean, I think the challenge most people have is they think, well, that must mean I want to sing worship songs all the time, and I don't even like the ones we have to sing two or three times around here. <laughs> do I have to quote the Bible all the time? What does it mean that I get to do life with God? I mean, I think in some ways, even the earliest disciples of Jesus, they're confused by this. I think it's why the resurrection... And Jesus frustrated them so much. I mean, Jesus says to them before he's crucified, not long before, I'm about to go away, and when I go away, it's a good thing for you because when I go away, you're going to do greater things than I have ever done. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and it's going to be way better after I'm gone. And they couldn't figure that out. I mean, for three years, life with God had been pretty easy. They went to sleep. God was in the next bunk. It was Jesus. He woke up the next day, they woke up, wherever he went, they went. Whatever he did, they just joined right in. I mean, life with God was just looking for what Jesus was doing, asking how you could help, and hanging out with him wherever he went. More importantly, they thought, I'll just do that as long as I can. And then he says to them, I'm going away, and it's going to be significantly better for you. I mean, it's going to be way better for you. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, how am I better off on this side of the resurrection than they were on the other side? Not in heaven. How am I better off because of the resurrection right now? How is it better for me that Jesus decided to go away after he resurrected instead of staying here? What does the resurrection mean for me right now? Well, I'm going to show you some scripture about the importance of the resurrection. It's not a normal Easter scripture. Um, and it's about the importance, not somewhere in the future, it's right now. It's found in Romans chapter 5, which is a good chapter to find things like this because the whole chapter is about salvation. It's where Paul's talking about salvation and he discusses it, what it means to followers of Christ. In verse 8 and following, he says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We love that. I mean, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to get cleaned up. Long before I was capable of being with God, God sent his son for me. The problem for most of us is that's the only part of that verse we know. We don't read the rest of this. And you'll notice if you're following along on your, on your device or in, a, in an actual copy of a paper Bible, that's not where it is. He, Paul goes on. Much more than, than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, 
You'll notice if you're reading along, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved through his wrath? If you look in the most English translations, between wrath and through, most translators add two little words. They add wrath of God. The problem is, of God isn't there in the English, I mean in the Greek. They add it in because we so often think the problem I have with God is God is mad at me. And they've got to add in wrath of God to make sense to English-speaking audiences because that's what you think. But the Greek doesn't say, I'm saved from the wrath of God, just from wrath. Here's a question I have for you. You ever need to be saved from your own wrath? Some of y'all don't have no problem with your own wrath. You haven't done some things in your life when you were angry, said some things to people you would die for that you wish you hadn't said. Ever had to look around at some people you really care about and you know they needed to be saved from your wrath? I mean, all the confusion that's at work in our world I mean, think of the mess that is our world, how much of it is caused by not God's wrath, our wrath. I mean, look at families falling apart. Why? Somebody is ticked off at somebody. I mean, people that stood in front of their family said, we're going to do this forever. They can't do it for another day because somebody's mad. You look at the wars going on around the world because somebody got angry at somebody else because some imaginary border that somebody made up before they were born. And people fight and kill over wrath. I mean, think about the child abuse and the school shootings and the mess in our world, all the rest because of wrath. And if you read a little bit more, he goes on to say, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God for the death of of his son, by the death of his son is what that should say. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his, what's the next word? What do you think the next word is? Saved by his, by his grace, by his teaching. It's saved by his life. Not the life before, because we, we just read he died. He came back to life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is alive right now. He is alive in this world right now. He is at work in this world right now. And those of us who choose to do life with him, we are actively right now being saved, not by his death, not by his grace, not by his teaching, by his life. His life that is at work in us. Then where is Jesus alive? He's alive with us, all around us. You just have to look. You have to begin to see it. See, better than thinking of salvation as some place you go instead of another place you don't want to go, salvation, Jesus clearly says in, in John 17, these are my words, salvation is being caught up in the eternal life that Jesus is now living on the earth. Salvation is you and I getting caught up in the salvation that he is, the life he's living. Where is he living it? He's living in an ordinary people that choose, this is what we've been talking about for months, choose to do interactive life with him. Choose to walk around and say, Lord, what are you doing right there? Can I join? Lord, what are you saying that I should do right now? He lives in those who choose to give up living out their own stories and asking him, begging him to do something in the story they're writing, giving up their own plans and dreams of their lives, and instead join Jesus in the life he's living, the life that he's reconciling everything on this planet to himself, where his kingdom is coming, his will is going to be done on this earth as it is in heaven, where there's injustice, inequality, he wants to right those wrongs. And if you will join with him, he will do it. He will begin to correct it. 
We join him in reconciling relationships, places where our wrath or the wrath of somebody else got out of hand and caused us to be separated. We join Jesus to bring back the wholeness of God's love in this world because he, we have been reconciled by his death and we are saved by his life that he is living. And seated all around you this morning are people who are living that interactive life right now. How everything really started was when I retired. And then after a while, I was just looking for something to do. The hard thing about it is just to experience or listen to what these children have been through. That's the hardest part for me. And to wrap my head around how mothers or fathers can do what they do. Um, that, that, really, that really hits hard, you know? And I'm just so, my heart is like water. Like my sister says, I'm full of water. So when something happened, I'm ready to cry. So, <laughs> you know, but then I have, I had two little boys and whoopee, they got adopted. <laughs> just experience that and then find out that they got adopted. You know, it's like, ooh, you know, it's, it really makes you cry and smile at the same time. And you'd be happy and sad for the biological parents, and then you're so happy for the foster parent, you know? So it's a double-edged sword. My very first time serving, I was a nervous wreck. I was just, you know, clean me. I was nervous. I thought I was gonna say the wrong things to somebody. Is this what I should be doing? Should they have someone like me, you know, being a face of a church? How could someone like me, with a past like me, be a face of a church? You know, how can someone like me represent Jesus in a way that he should be represented? In? So when I was 23, my little sister was 17 years old. And she got into a tragic uh, drowning accident. So it was very sudden, we lost her. Um, she was my only sibling that I had and she was my baby. I watched her come into this world and I literally watched her leave this world. I was so angry at God. How could you take someone so precious from me? How could you take someone so innocent, someone just has a full life ahead of them? How could you take that, take them away from us? I was already broken before, and I think that was just the final straw for me. I spiraled downhill. And people would try to come to me and tell me, you know, oh, let's just pray about it. And I would laugh in their face. They would tell me, oh, she's just in a better place. I would laugh in their face. How could you tell me she's in a better place when that person, when God's the one who came and took her away from me? And so I spent probably a good two years of my life just living a life of God's not real. He's not here. He's not for me. And no matter what I do, I have crossed a line with God now that I've told him I've hated him. And no matter how much of forgiveness I have asked, he will never forgive me for this. And even once I started coming to church and started being a part of Community Christian, I still had that doubt inside myself. How could someone like me, how could God forgive me? I can sit here and do everything that I'm supposed to do, but he's still gonna have that thought about me in the back of his mind. I would say I spent you know, the majority of the beginning of my life chasing after things of the world and it ended up winding me up in prison. And that was a dark time, you know, a very lonely, cold time in life. Uh, in the midst of that, I decided to turn to God. I decided that I wanted to, you know, turn my feet in God's direction and walk after Him. And um, then I ended up finding this as my church home. You know, my experience with church in the past was um, very, I guess, what the world sees church as, very judgmental, very, uh, you know, not come as you are like this church is. So when I got asked to do children's ministry, I was all for it because I have like a heart after the youth, you know, because, uh, you know, growing up, I didn't have that guidance like that kind of ran around with the youth and did what I wanted and the group of youth that I ran around with didn't have God in their lives so 
I felt like my first draw was to children and youth and to reach out to them and and to develop relationships with these with these kids that you know are looking for uh, acceptance from people and they're looking for guidance and you know just show them the love of God at an early age so they see that it's you know that's what it's meant to be a relationship with people that care about you so I was such a lost wonder I was alone I didn't have a community with me I just felt like you know no, I shouldn't be around anybody. But coming here to community, I've noticed and seen just how we have to have people around us, how we have to have this community to be able to move forward. I've noticed just the encouragement that it has given my children. It's given my three daughters. They see their mom serving and loving Jesus with her whole heart and encourages them to do the same. It, and it also encourages me to see that my daughters don't have to grow up like I grew up. They get to grow up knowing Jesus from the very beginning and they get to feel his love and get, be able to love him back you know, their whole life. And I'm so grateful for that. It's interesting. It's also a little heartbreaking to see that you so many people that don't have anyone to just come and say hi. Because sometimes when we go and deliver meals, they want you to just come and say hi, you know. If God didn't put me in that position, because he was the one that really put me there, if it wasn't for us, what would some of those people be, you know? In the course that I've been doing it, I've, some of the sweetest people have passed. No, but um, like I said, to be in their lives for the time that we were, and they know us by name, they speak to us and we joke with them and whatnot, to be able to just give them that um, little joy during that time, I think that's all God's work. Growing up with uh, my brother, he's a year and two months older than me, he was basically my hero. And then uh, life, you know, led him into some trying times and I was actually succeeding in life and had found some success um, and then there was some infidelity there between my partner and him and that infidelity led to a breaking of our relationship uh, and a lot of hatred and bitterness and yeah it was about 17 years of we didn't even speak you know and now that I started this walk with God uh, trying to hear what God is saying to me this past Christmas. I was on the couch Christmas morning having my coffee and doing my, you know, morning prayer thing. And I just felt God leading me in the direction to reach out to my brother. And after I reached out to him, we eventually started seeing each other again. He was coming over to my house on the weekends. We were grilling out. And the craziest thing is, is that he ended up passing away about two weeks ago, which he passed away three days after he had came to my house last. So instead of being distraught, now that I'm walking with God like this, I had the opportunity to look at the situation the way God would want me to see it. And that was that, hey, I, you listened to me and now that relationship was mended. And because I wasn't willing to follow the, you know, the path that God set me on, there was good that came from it instead of it being a crushing moment in life. You know, growing up, I knew we all have a purpose here. And once I became a mom at 21, and so I thought, okay, I finally found my purpose. This is it, is to be a mom, you know? And then I also became a wife and I said, okay, this is my purpose, is to be a mother and a wife. And this is it, this is all I need to focus on. And boy, was I wrong. I have slowly realized that is, that's not my purpose. My purpose here in life is to be a follower of Christ, is to show, is to be that light that others can see that shines bright for Jesus and just to help others, bring others close to him and just to share that love. So that invitation of doing interactive life with God, it's the opportunity to join our lives to the life Jesus is currently living in our world that you just heard spoke about. See, we've been learning around here for the past few weeks. Life is not about me getting 
my story to go exactly like I want it to go or the way that I planned it to go. But my purpose here is to join my life with the story that Jesus is telling. And like you just heard, it's a story of ordinary men, ordinary women, joining Jesus to love and serve other people, to just bring wholeness and peace, to bring heaven to earth. See, Jesus said this was a life, if you would choose to live it, that would overflow with peace and joy and love more than you could even imagine. So before we go any further today, I want to ask you a question. Where's God inviting you to join him? In this life. The life that he's living right now in this world. Maybe there's a relationship you need to reach out and bring God's healing to and his wholeness into. Maybe there's an opportunity for you to serve someone or to go into some area of our world that God has called you to go into. Maybe there's just something in your own personal life God is inviting you to give over to him. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're new to faith. and Or maybe you've stayed away for a while and now you're trying to come back. And your next step is just simply this. Just come on back. Come on back next week. Or maybe you're ready to take a step into our community. And it's time for you to sign up for next steps and investigate life with God in our community. I don't know what your next step is. That's between you and God. And it can, might feel like I'm giving you a lot of thoughts and a lot of information. So I'm going to just stop talking here in a minute. And I'm going to give you some space, some quiet. And I want to give you this time to reflect, talk to God, and ask him how he wants you to join him in the story that he's telling in this world. And after you've had that time of prayer, our band's going to come and they're going to lead us in a song that celebrates the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but not just the life that he lived 2,000 years ago. We're celebrating the life he lives right now among us. So you take a moment, talk to God, and then we'll sing. done yet. Um, (laughs) My name is Nathan, and uh, I'm on the teaching team here with Ed and Jason as well. And, uh, you know, anybody who follows Jesus in their life has a moment, uh, and probably multiple moments, when their story intersects with Jesus' story. And one of those moments for me in my life was actually uh, in a really powerful way on Easter morning in 2020. Uh, 2020 was one of those moments, I think, in everybody's life where uh, your story was not going to go the way you planned for it to go. Uh, You had things that you thought were going to happen that year, and they did not happen. Uh, For me personally, it was really trying. My career had just shifted, and in fact, a lot of the things before the pandemic that I had started that I thought were going to be the next five years of my career suddenly all evaporated. And at the same time, I was asked to kind of take a bigger leadership part of our church, and that happened right about the time we went through a global pandemic and no one knew what to do. And uh, so it was really uncertain. It was scary. At the same time, my family had just grown from three to six as we had just adopted uh, these three beautiful girls. And uh, actually, at the time, we were still just fostering them. And so everyone's now stuck at home together all the time. And there was a lot of things that were just uncertain for me. They were uncertain uh, for my wife. It's certainly for my children and their future. I just, I didn't know how things were going to be. And whenever you get to a place where you're not sure what to do, all you're kind of left with are just anxiety and stress. And so I felt alone because much of my relational support system, we were cut off from one another. We couldn't be physically together. And here we were on Easter Sunday in 2020, and we were not able to be physically together as a church. I'm sure all of you who at least were here with us remember what that was like. And I'm at home trying to lead these four children to understand the importance of this day. But inwardly, 
I'm not doing well. Emotionally, I'm not doing well. Spiritually, I'm not doing well. And in many ways, this is where I think the disciples were on Easter morning, as Ed has already talked about here, that the future they had planned, we're going to follow this guy. He's going to be king. There's going to be a kingdom here on earth, and we're going to be the right-hand guys. It's instantly gone. And they're heartbroken. They're spiritually confused. Is God even working in the middle of this? Because we thought he was God, and now he's dead. And maybe that's where you're at today. You're uncertain because of something in your life or in your marriage or with one of your kids, and you're not sure how that story will end. Well, it's good news because today is Easter. And today is the day that we're reminded of where every story is headed. Every single story. But on Easter morning 2020, I couldn't see it, and so I sit down to read the Easter story. And I really did not want to, but I thought, well, I'm a preacher, so I have to. And so I sit down, I read those first 10 verses that we've already read about them going to the tomb, and they don't see anything, and they flee. And then Peter and John come to the tomb, and they can't see anything, and they just leave. And then I get to this part of the story that I'm going to read to you today. It's just after Peter and the disciples leave the tomb, and Mary Magdalene is left there. John tells us, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One was at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she said, they have taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And I think we've all been there before at some place in our life. We're in the midst of something. Some uncertainty, some pain, some struggle, some disappointment. And we can't see that Jesus is right there. Now he's there, we just didn't know it was him. A few years ago, several years ago, I lost a really good friend of mine to suicide. And I struggled for a long time with all of that. I wondered, maybe there was something I should have been doing. Felt a lot of guilt around it. I certainly thought maybe there was something God should have been doing. And so for years, I just, I didn't really even talk to God about it. I realized after I'd gone to counseling about it, he said, you're just not even praying about it. And so I just prayed one morning, God, where were you in all of this? And this doesn't happen much for me, but in that moment, as I had my eyes closed and I did, I just had an image in my mind of my friend in his final moment, and Jesus was standing there holding him. And he said, this is where I was. He couldn't see it, and you couldn't see it. But here I was as he took his last breath. I never left him, and I've never left you. And maybe for you today, maybe as you listen to some of the stories we just heard, you can relate because you say, where has God been this last year? Where's, where's Jesus been these last five years? Where's Jesus been my whole life? And maybe you're wondering, God, where are you in this situation I'm facing? And he said, I'm right here, but you can't always see it. And you think, well, God, what do I do now? And he says, well, if I'm here, I just need you to be here with me. On that Easter in 2020, Jesus was right there with me in my anger, in my confusion, in my heartbreak, in my uncertainty. I couldn't see it, but he was there, and he was with Mary at the tomb. She didn't realize it. John tells us, Jesus asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, so there's something about Jesus' resurrection body that looks like a gardener. <laughs> she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him. I'll go get him. And I couldn't get through that last sentence in 2020. I just broke down crying. Now, you got to imagine this from my daughter's point of view. They'd only been in our house for about six months, and I'm a pretty big guy. And so we're sitting at this table, and I'm reading the Bible, and then I just start weeping, and they start freaking out, going, what is happening right now? And they start going, Daddy, why are you crying? And I couldn't answer because I couldn't stop crying. I just could not stop sobbing at the middle of this table. And they said, Daddy, why are you crying? I had this overwhelming love washing over me in the moment, and eventually I was able to calm down enough, and I said to them, I don't think I've ever loved Jesus as much as Mary loves him in this moment. I don't think I've ever loved Jesus as much. She thinks he's dead. 
that she so badly wants to be with him. All the other guys have run away. And she says, I'll wait here knowing that the Romans are probably going to come at some point and they may arrest me and they may kill me, but I just want to be with him. Even if his body is dead, I just want to hold his body. I just want to take care of him. I just want to be with him. I don't care what anyone has to do. I want to be with Jesus. And what happened for me in that moment is that I remembered why it is that I follow Jesus. It is not because I thought he would bless my story and make it turn out the way I thought it would be, or that I had these children and I had a way I wanted their story to go. And I thought, you know, if I follow and I pray enough, he'll fix things for them long term. Or that I thought even one day he'll take care of my afterlife. It's because every moment of my existence, Jesus has been holding me. He has been with me. He has cared for me. He has loved me. He died for me. And he has brought about a new life that is possible for me. The reason I follow Jesus is I love him because he first loved me. And I just just want to love him well. I just want to be with him. I just want to get my life caught up in the life that he is currently living in this world. Because this life is not a story about me. And this life is not a story about you. I know we have been convinced that if this life is going to be good and you're going to have a good life, you're going to have to make it work. That is not true. It is a story about Jesus. And I want to give my life to learn how to love him well. See, when my life, my story wasn't going the way I planned it to be, it feels like a tragedy. And maybe there's a lot of it for you right now this year that your life, it feels like a tragedy. It feels like your story is over. But today is Easter Sunday, and today is the day we remember that the worst thing is never the last thing, that the worst thing that could ever happen is not the last thing that will happen because Jesus has risen, and he has filled all creation with his presence. He is right here with you, and he is inviting you to join your story, no matter how broken it is, no matter how hopeless it may feel, just join it to his story. He is inviting you into a story where you can be fully known and fully loved, and you're able to know and love the God who created you. And it will not be the story that you had in mind for yourself. But I promise, if you delight yourself in his story, it will be better than anything you could imagine. The same was true for Mary. When she realized it was Jesus, she called out to him. And the text doesn't say it, but I believe she runs up and she hugs him because... Jesus had to say to her, don't hold on to me. And that's not Jesus saying, gross, no hugs. (laughs) It's not he didn't want to be near Mary. I think because he knew she was holding on to him because she was holding on to the old story she'd planned. He's back. It's just going back to the way it was before. It's just everything's going to go back. He's blessing the story that I had planned before. He He would be with me, but he says, don't hold on to me because I have to return to my Father. And as Ed's already said, when he returns to the Father, he will come and dwell within her closer than when he was standing there, right there where she could hold him, that the Holy Spirit would descend. And he says, this will be better. But even more than that, he says, don't hold on to me. Go to my disciples and tell them. And he says, tell them that you've seen me. Jesus had a new story in mind for Mary that she couldn't see, that she, in fact, would be the first preacher of the good news. This nonsense that we have that maybe women shouldn't teach is ridiculous when Jesus himself told Mary, you're going to be the first preacher. You're going to be the first one to go out and say, Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. She was the apostle to the apostles. And so he says, I have this story in mind for you. It is better than you could imagine because it's my story, not your story. That's my hope for you this Easter. That no matter what's going on in your life, where you are in your faith journey, I hope first that you would see that Jesus is with you. And that mostly it would just fill your heart with love for him. That you also would want to join your story to his story. But that means you have to stop holding on to your story. You got to let it go. And if you're not even sure you believe in him, my prayer is that maybe today with what you've heard, even if you're not sure you can believe in him, maybe you want it to be true that you want it to be true, and that maybe you'll keep coming back and you'll try to figure out what your next step is with him because the greatest story possible for your life is the one where you let go of your life.
and you let go of your story and you get your life caught up in the life that Jesus is currently living in this world. And that mostly is not a life about what he wants you to do for him. It is mostly a life about you loving and being loved by him. And there is nothing better than that. So as we end, we're going to honor Jesus by receiving this meal of love that we call the Lord's Supper. And I've invited Jason to come and lead us in that. Which I am now in no shape to do. It's been this way for the past year for me when I sense the presence of Jesus the way Nathan just talked about. I'm just a mess. But here we come every week, you know, and we gather in places like this and we receive this meal. And for those of you who are new, this is called the Lord's Supper. This is communion. And it's just a, a time that we simply sit with Jesus and we get a chance to thank him and be blessed by the amazing gift of his love that he gave through his body and blood when he gave it on the cross. And we do this in very tangible way. We take emblems of bread and juice and they just are embodiments of the blood and the body of Jesus that minister to us. And again, if you're new and this is weird to you and you're not even sure you believe all that, I get it. And I can understand how that sounds really strange and you're weirded out by me being so emotional. I get it. So during this time, if that's where you are, that's okay. Don't feel obligated to participate, but just reflect during this quiet time. Think about what you've experienced. If you'd like to take a risk, would you pray? Ask God if he's real that you might know him more and make he would make himself real to you. Because we believe there's something powerful about this meal where the presence of God is somehow just closer to us. This is not just a ritual for us. This is an opportunity to commune with the one who loves us more than we can even imagine or take in. It's a reminder, he is so near to you, whether or not you realize it. He is closer than the bread you will eat. He's closer than the cup you will drink from. He is right here with you. Jesus is with you. And if you just be open to meeting him today, he wants to share this meal with you. He wants to share his presence with you. And as we do, today we're going to do it a little differently. When I step down from the stage, our band's going to begin singing a song to you for you to just sit with Jesus for just a few moments and be reminded of how beautiful he is, how wonderful he is, how powerful Jesus is, and what a blessing it has been that we got invited into life with him. It's hard to take in, isn't it? That's why Jesus came to live among us. The apostle John calls Jesus the word of God. That means this is the way God chose to express himself, to reveal himself to us, taking on flesh and blood, living among us. And in the moment of his death, there was a veil in the temple that had separated the presence of God from his people. And as soon as Jesus took his last breath, that veil in the temple split in two. And the separation between God and people was gone. So now he's with us. And because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that means that nothing is ever going to separate you from life with God. So that's what we're going to celebrate today. So as the band sings this song to you, I want to invite you to eat and drink the symbols you were given when you came in the room. And then in a, in a moment in the song, they're going to invite you to stand and join with them. So take time right now and receive communion. Hey there, thanks for stopping by to check out this message. If you've been feeling the call to take your next step in following Jesus, we're here to support you every step of the way. Feel free to reach out to us at community-christian.net or connect with us on any of our social media platforms. And hey, I'm super excited to share that we've got two amazing podcasts you might really enjoy. First up, there's three peas in a pod where three of our speakers dive deep into questions about the Bible and life. Then there's Not Great Parents, 
which is just perfect for us parents navigating the ups and downs of parenthood. Both of these podcasts release fresh episodes every week, so make sure to tune in and give them a listen.